Good afternoon, everyone from uh, New York City, still under partial lockdown, but very eager to pass to the second phase of the reopening and to the new reality, whatever that may mean. But hopefully more uh, relaxation and uh, more going, going out. We are um, very happy to um, welcome to this uh, edition one of the brightest uh, minds in uh, international uh, development, um, international economic cooperation, banking, finance, Dr. Charles Frank. Dr. Frank, thank you for accepting our invitation and welcome to the program. Well, thank you for sending me the invitation. I appreciate it. Um, Ch Charles Frank, um, graduated uh, from Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, Institute, uh, took his um, PhD in economics from uh, Princeton University, where was the one of the youngest um, tenured uh, professors in the history of the university. In fact, there is a slight uh, debate whether he was uh, the youngest or the second uh, second youngest uh, tenured uh, professor, uh, but he also he where he uh, he taught um, economics and uh, international affairs. He also taught at uh, Yale University and on uh, Mackerel uh, University in uh, Uganda. Uh, he. He had a long and very fruitful um, career. Uh, he was um, acting president of the um, European Bank for uh, Reconstruction and uh, Development, uh, a deputy assistant uh, secretary of state for economic and uh, social affairs, and uh, chief economist on the policy planning staff of the U, uh, US uh, Department of State. He was a senior, um, a senior uh, fellow of the Brookings Institution, the influential um, Washington-based uh, think tank. He was um, also director of the um, uh, Central uh, European Media Enterprises, Vice President of uh, Solomon um, Brothers and uh, G uh, Capital. He is the owner of uh, Time Out um, uh, Bucharest and is currently uh, um, a board member of um, influential NGO Alianza, an NGO um, working to strengthen Romanian-American uh, relations uh, and our partner in organizing um, today's uh, edition of the Leon Ferraru uh, conferences. Um, Dr. Frank, uh, welcome, uh, welcome again. Um, I will uh, start by um, I will start with a topic related to Romania. This is a country that you know well um, from a professional standpoint, but also uh, from a personal one. Not least um, uh, being uh, married to the extraordinary. Eleonor Sebastian Frank, who was born in, uh, in Romania and has kept a very close um, relationship to Romania. But in 1981, you uh, weren't prepared to uh, take a trip uh, to Romania to visit um, Eleonor's uh, relatives, but also, but, uh, but to meet with no other then Nicolae Ceausescu, the, the dictator of um, socialist um, Romania. Tell us about the circumstances of this um, faithful meeting. <clears throat> well, um, in 1981, I was working for Solomon Brothers, which at the time was one of the most uh, prestigious investment banks uh, on Wall Street. And in the summer of, uh, of 1981, a company called Philip Brothers 
purchased Solomon Brothers. And Philip Brothers had uh, significant ties to Romania. It had an office in Bucharest and was in the commodity trading business uh, and did a lot of commodity trading uh, transactions with, uh, with Romania. <clears throat> and the chairman of Philip Brothers, uh, his name was Milton Rosenthal, um, was very active in helping Romania get what is called most favored nation treatment by the United States, which means that the United States uh, would open up its uh, economy to uh, Romanian exports on terms, tariff terms that were as good as any other country uh, could get. So it was really important for Romania to get this MFN because it helped uh, the Romanian economy and it helped Romanian uh, trade. Well, Mr. Rosenthal came to John Goodfriend, who was then the president of uh, Solomon Brothers, and said, look, Romania has a problem. They have a significant amount of debt, a million, $11 billion, which at the time was really something. Uh, and they need help in rescheduling it because they can't pay it off, or they have difficulty at least in paying it off. So uh, I am close to, I know the president of the country, Mr. Ceausescu, and I can schedule a meeting um, uh, with him where we can make a pitch to serve as advisor to Romania to reschedule their debt. So uh, John Goodfriend came to me and said, look, will you get in touch with uh, Mr. Rosenthal and work out something with him, which I did. And he said, look, I've scheduled a meeting before he had a certain date. I can't remember exactly at the time what it was. Um, and he said, but I'm gonna bring my wife along. Would you like to bring your wife along? I said, do you realize my wife is Romanian and she may not be welcome? <laughs> uh, uh, so we checked with the Romanian consulate here in New York and they said she's fine, not to worry. Of course, so we then arrived in Romania and of course, Eleanor who spoke perfect Romanian had a translator, which was obviously uh, a government uh, official in the Securitate. So, uh, and we had a, we, we were wined and dined and then we had a meeting the next day with Ceausescu and it, it lasted four hours. And Mr. Rosenthal and I hardly got in a word. <laughs> Ceausescu talked like three hours and 50 minutes of those four, four hours and mainly bragging about what Romania had done for the United States in opposing Russian expansionism uh, in uh, uh, promoting nuclear, uh, uh, demilitarization, um, and uh, it, it was very clear to me that this was a, a political game here. He was not really interested in rescheduling the debt. He just wanted to score some political points with the US, with Mr. Rosenthal, and he knew that Mr. Rosenthal had friends in high places, so but that by welcoming him there, he would help in his relationships politically with the United States. So instead of uh, um, a negotiation and a discussion based on, on Facts. <laughs> economic uh, rights and economic um, reason, it was uh, in fact a political conversation, a sort of uh, diplomatic uh, exchange in the end, right? Exactly, exactly. We tried to uh, follow it up with a few proposals to assist them on uh, financing certain things, but uh, it never went anywhere. So it was a waste of time, but it was, uh, for me, really something special. And I really, uh, really enjoyed it. But it also became clear to me that Romania was in deep, deep trouble uh, because the buildings we were in, the meetings we were in would be cold because they'd turn off the heating. They'd be dark because nobody wanted to have uh, too many lights on. Um, and the food would be, you go to a restaurant and you, you'd be lucky to get one dish. I mean, it was just, and you go to a shop and there was no food. You might see a few salamis hanging from the ceiling, but nothing else in a, in a butcher shop. 
This is not, uh, not Nicolae Ceausescu who's knocking at the door, I suppose, but somebody's working beneath your apartment, right? That's right. Now you're, you're hearing it. <laughs> you can hear it, but uh, no, it's not, it's not annoying at all. No, go ahead. Sorry for this interruption. <laughs> Um, well, anyway, so that's 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 it. So it was, uh, it was a country that was uh, at, uh, at the beginning of a very dark, cold, and uh, and um, uh, complicated decade in uh, in its history. Uh, did you when you it was your first visit to Romania? Could you compare it to something you had seen before, or it was the first impression? No. It was, it was... I've never seen anything like that. I mean, it's, and, and it only got worse, as you know, because uh, That's right. the government um, squeezed the, uh, the economy to export and they paid off half their debt by 1985 and all of it by 1989. So they got rid of the debt, but then the Romanians got rid of uh, of a, Yeah. And <laughs> And during that time of, of a lot of things. Uh, but um, uh, so you have the feel, looking back, you have the feeling that the decision had already been taken uh, somehow yeah. to no, uh, uh, not to try to restructure the debt, to, pers uh, to reschedule it, but to go on a different path, like paying all the debts and, uh, and uh, relying on exports and all the, the, the elements of, of, of the economic debt, but not on the terms that he thought he could get. I mean, he thought he, he didn't, he, he wasn't realistic about what economic terms he could get. And he wasn't realistic about the political concessions that he needed to make. In order to get the international community behind him, he had to uh, allow immigration, um, particularly of the Jews, uh, but all other minorities and allow free travel. Um, and so the US put a lot of pressure on him uh, to uh, improve his human rights performance. And in that environment, he wasn't willing to make the concessions he needed to make in order to get the economic uh, help he would have liked to have had. But for, for uh, almost four hours, he spoke about um about uh, foreign policy, about Romanian foreign policy and how helpful he was, Romania was, uh, to the United States on various uh, dossiers. Uh, he wanted, did, did he want to trade this, um, uh, this uh, political, um, political attitudes uh, for economic concessions? Because he asked for a very, very favorable term for uh, for um, uh, uh, for you know borrowing even more money, you know, than a different rate. Well, he just you know he just wasn't realistic. He didn't realize what he had to do. He didn't want to do what he had to do uh, in order to get the economic help. So he squeezed the Romanian people. D D as you remember him, um, do you remember him as uh, somebody that was out, uh, out of touch with reality or on the contrary, somebody very shrewd uh, as, uh, as many say? That's hard to say. I, 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 if he were shrewd, he could have gotten the, <laughs> he would have made enough political concessions to, uh, to uh, achieve his economic goals. No he, no, he didn't really want to have to pay off the debt, but he wanted to do it because he wasn't willing to pay the price. Uh, when, uh, when you left uh, the meeting and in your plane back to the United States, um, did you have the feeling that uh, Romania was at an inflection point that was um, something, uh, something different was uh, about to begin in terms of the economic realities um, that uh, change was, uh, was in the air, a new policy was uh, about to be reenacted. Did you have uh, this? Well, I, I certainly wasn't very hopeful. I mean, I, I saw the poor, poor conditions uh, under which people lived. 
um, and uh, I saw no particular reason why that would improve. So it looked to me like it was just going to get worse, and it did. And, and also because of the fact that they were not uh, realistic about, um, you know, how to deal with this uh, mounting debt, yeah. that was, uh, crushing the, the Romanian, uh, Romanian economy. Correct. Because um, I'm, I'm asking because, um, because some, um, some historians, some political scientists locate the beginning of the end uh, on this uh, really uh, mad policy of uh, uh, devoting everything to it, uh, experts and uh, relying on experts and emphasizing experts more than anything else and, um, and uh, making, uh, making your own people go hungry and all these shortages and cold and dark. And uh, that's why I, I've always found uh, fascinating this story because, you know, I must admit, I, uh, I, I learned about it uh, for, for quite some time, your meeting with uh, Nicolae Ceausescu, because I find it that it's, you know, sometime the beginning of the end and you were just there, you know, of course, as a, as a participant in history, sometimes, you know, you, you, you can't, um, realize that you are in, in fact facing a, an, a historical moment or, or leaving a historical moment. But, um, but it's, something, uh, it's something that, you know, after that, it will, uh, the relationship with the United States wasn't that, uh, that good anymore, even though it had been very good in the late 60s, during the 70s. So everything, um, everything, Everything changed after that, right? Yes, I mean, it, it, the most favored nation treatment was gained by Romania in the mid '70s. But in 1988, Ceausescu actually renounced the most favored nation treaty and decided he didn't need uh, that help. Uh, that was an incredibly stupid uh, decision, but. It, he was just angry with the uh, pressure being put on him on human rights issues and on democratic uh, uh, government issues. So he was not rational, particularly near the end. And uh, so it's not surprising he was, uh, he, 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 he was overthrown. Thankfully, we have now a completely, completely different situation with our uh, strategic partnership with the U.S., of course, very close ties on many, many levels. So it's definitely uh, a thing of a long, long uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, and long past, long back in the, in the past. But um, let's... Um, let's um, uh, get now to the present. Um, of course, we are passing through a very difficult time with the global um, medical crisis, a blog, uh, global pandemic that has triggered uh, a lot of um, social, economic, political uh, consequences. People are uh, talking about a crisis of huge uh, economic crisis of huge proportions, one that we haven't seen since probably the Great Depression of the, of the early 30s. Um, how bad it is? What do you think? Well, uh, it's all relative. I mean, in fact, um, the World Bank projects that the world economy will decline by uh, 5% uh, in, in 2020 over 2019. And uh, the World Trade Organization projects that international trade will decline at best by 13% and at worst by 32%. So there's gonna be a huge, uh, huge impact. Uh, however, uh, and it's and it's worse than the 2008-9 Great Recession. Credit crunch of 2008. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, for example, unemployment uh, in the U.S. 
today is around 15%. At its worst in 2009-10, it was uh, 10%. And the decline in GDP is about half, about twice this time around than it was in the Great Recession. But the Great Depression was far worse. Um, the decline in output was 30%. Unemployment rate was 25% at various times. So uh, this, this economic shock is somewhere between the Great Depression and the 2008-9 Great Recession. But still, it's bad, and there are going to be a lot of people out of work, and um, it's very sad. But um, do, you, do you see, because people are talking about a uh, U-shaped recovery or, or a V-shaped recovery, meaning that it's a U-shape, it's a slow recovery, it's a painful recovery, while the V-shape, you know, until we, um, as soon as we find a vaccine or, you know, something, something happens, then the, um, uh, the economy uh, takes off again and... Uh, and uh, everything is uh, back in normal. How, how do you see it? What, what's your sense about it? So I think it, it's likely to be a combination of V and U. <laughs> By that I mean, um, it looks like um, there may be a bounce back in 2021 from the decline in 2020. For example, in the case of Romania, uh, the IMF is projecting a uh, decline of 5% in 2020, but an increase in GDP of 3.9% uh, in 2021. So that looks a little bit like a V, but it's gonna take a long time to really get back to where we were. So you have maybe a, a blip uh, as the reopening of the economy takes place, but it takes a long time uh, for us to get back to where we were before the COVID uh, crisis hit us. And projecting what's going to happen is, is pretty difficult because um, we don't, there are so many, so many uncertainties. Uh, for example, we don't know how, how uh, strong will be the uh, economic stimulus uh, reaction to the crisis. We don't know how quickly the reopening will take place. Um, we don't know um, yeah. how quickly the virus will be able to be conquered. Yeah. The longer it takes, the longer it's yeah. gonna take for recovery. And we don't know whether people will resume their prior habits in terms of going to theater, entertainment, um, uh, restaurants and bars and so on, people may stay away from them, even if the economy is fully opened, they may just not go and prefer to stay at home and not take the risk. So all of these things combine to raise the possibility that it's going to take a very long time to fully recover, although there may be a, an immediate positive. Um, in, in any crisis, there are, um, uh, of course, a lot of losers, uh, a lot of um, industries. Of course, people are, are losing a lot, but there are winners as well. Do you see any, any winners in uh, this process of recovery? Um, because I will, uh, I will tell you who are one of the major losers, and that's the cultural sector. But I'll, I'll get <laughs> back to that uh, a little later. But are there any losers in this um, you know, troubled time, in this economic turmoil? Well, you asked first whether there are any winners. I, it, it's, I think, rather hard to find winners. We do know that Zoom is probably a winner. Of course, technology. <laughs> technology, some, certain types of technology. And of course, that uh, Amazon is a big winner. Uh, Why? Uh, but uh, it's hard to find many other uh, that you can... The losers will be wide all over the place. I mean, you can have uh, airlines, cruise lines, uh, the arts, especially so. theater and... Uh, 
the opera, you know, the arts in general are in deep trouble. That's right. uh, airline manufacturing, airplane manufacturing, rather. Um, Hospitality. Bars, restaurants. Uh, I mean, you, the, the, nearly everybody is going to be hit by this. There are very, with very few exceptions. Yes, we look with a lot of uh, apprehension to what lies ahead, especially because, of course, we are uh, working in the arts and the, the cultural, the arts sector is very, very hard hit by the, not only by the pandemic, but what, uh, by the, the emerging uh, economic crisis. We are here in New York, as you, you know so well, because you are um, you and the loner are uh, arts lovers uh, and you know go and see all sorts of uh, cultural uh, programming uh, arts is uh, is meant to reopen uh, art venues and cultural venues in the fourth phase so we still have to uh, quite quite some time until uh, things will uh, get back to normal uh, but uh, Talking about the arts, when do you think you will be able to see an um, opera, uh, opera performance or uh, a concert again in New York? Well, we'll be able to see them, but um, it, it depends on how the arts centers are, are reopening. Most likely, at least initially, there will be social distancing, right. which will mean that uh, uh, you won't be able to fill the auditorium. So you'll lose maybe half or uh, two thirds of, uh, of the revenues that you might otherwise uh, expect. Uh, so it's gonna take a, and also you have a problem of people's attitude. I'm not gonna go off to a, an opera tomorrow because, uh, you know, what's the point? I mean, why take the risk? Uh, That's right. Uh, and am I going to stay shy uh, and remain fearful even after everything is so fully reopened? Uh, I don't know, uh, but it's, it doesn't bode well. I mean, even today, I'm surprised I go to the Metropolitan Opera and you know, still I see a lot of empty seats. I mean, even before the crisis occurred, you know, they're, they're having their problems at, uh, at, at keeping the auditorium uh, filled. It's just going to get worse. Yes, you are not picturing, uh, picturing a very optimistic uh, image of the, of the cultural sector. I would add that some probably will never be able to recover on some of the smaller venues and so mm -hmm. smaller companies might not be able to survive this, uh, mm -hmm. this time without, uh, without the public because they've always been on the brink of bankruptcy mm -hmm. they've always had uh, problems so uh, uh, it's really it's really a, a tough time it's tough time for artists for technicians who are not able to um, uh, to make an income during this time mm -hmm. even though they can um, uh, they can benefit from the uh, from the the, the government's uh, the government support to um, uh, to a certain extent but uh, yeah, we talk about, so you, you see a, 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 a rather sluggish um, a recovery, uh, a, a V that it's more like a new in, in many a ways. Maybe, you know, maybe a partial V. Yeah. And then a, and then a, and a U. So it, it still needs some time until we, we get back to hopefully normal. To, to normal or the, the, uh, the reality before the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. How do you see the, uh, that this situation may affect the transatlantic relations? First with Europe, uh, Europe as a whole, and then we'll, we'll talk about the Romanian-American uh, economic relations. Well, as I, as I said earlier, uh, international trade will decline precipitously, more than GDP will decline, more than gross domestic product or output will decline. Um, but I, 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 don't, I, I don't see any, I'm not really worried about um, the crisis provoking a animosity between the United States and Europe. If anything, I think the, 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 the 
it may e even provide an environment to strengthen economic ties. Um, so, um, no, I don't see a, a big impact on international relations. I do see a big impact on trade. I see a big impact on, on uh, global uh, supply chains, mm -hmm. uh, which will, um, I mean, I think what this uh, crisis has shown us is that if you have a complicated and widely dispersed supply chain, you can get hit by a failure in any one link. And therefore, the more you're diversified in your supplies, the better off you are. And uh, the more you rely on any one group of suppliers in different countries, uh, uh, you know, you, 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 you may have a problem. So I think, it, I think there, there, there will be less trade associated. It's a longer run effect. The immediate effect will be just, you know, because of, of a, a collapse of demand, the whole trade economy will collapse, but there will be a longer term effect, uh, which could keep trade from growing longer term as much as it might otherwise uh, do. do. Do you see um, a, a rise in uh, economic uh, nationalism in, um, I don't know, uh, tem the temptation to invest more in your country rather than also to repatriate some of the industries and economy or shelter yourself behind tariffs. Do you see anything like that? Well, we already have in the United States uh, that's, that's led by a president that is uh, determined to disrupt uh, trade relations and with with the intent of trying to get more favorable uh, treatment. Um, but um, I don't know that it will in and of itself uh, uh, lead to um, uh, more nationalism. I mean, we're already there uh, with, with President Trump, uh, with uh, Xi from uh, Beijing and yeah, there will be treasures to yeah, get uh, protective uh, health equipment uh, from your own country rather than rely on someone else. But that's not going to be a major disruption to trade. And um, what about the, um, the American investment in, uh, in Romania, the economic relations uh, with, uh, with Romania? Do you think, uh, will it be affected? Well, first of all, there's very little economic uh, foreign investment from that comes from America. From America, the only the only significant one is the Ford uh, Ford Foundation investments in uh, automobile and uh, engine manufacture in uh, in Craiova, and that will uh, go on probably uh, regardless of the crisis. So it isn't a question of America. Um, reducing its foreign investment. Romania gets most of its foreign investment from the EU, uh, EU countries. Uh, and, and that will be affected because I think just in general, people are gonna be more cautious. Uh, they're gonna be more risk averse. Um, and so there will be a decline. In fact, uh, this, Foreign direct investment in Romania had been growing very rapidly since the 2008-9 recession. Uh, had been growing rapidly in, uh, in 2019, it reached 5.3 billion euro, uh, which, was, uh, which was very substantial and important to the uh, Romanian economy. But in the first quarter, first three months of this year, it looks like there's been a net outflow of investment. Um, so it, yeah, there's gonna be a, a significant negative impact on foreign direct investment, just as there is on trade. But, um, and, and how do you see the, uh, the major vulnerabilities of Romania during this time in, in economic terms, of course? Well, Romania was on a roll, to be honest, from 2008, nine until, 2019, uh, it grew at a very substantial rate. 
Yeah. One of Europe, the biggest Europe is first and second among all European countries That's right. in terms of economic growth. And it did it without being fiscally irresponsible. Uh, the uh, government budget uh, was uh, less than 3% of GDP for every year since I think 2011 until 2019, when it went over 3%, it went to 4.6%. So um, it's gonna have a hard time getting back to that good path that it was on. Uh, you add to that some of the political turmoil that Romania is undergoing. Uh, it, 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 the real vulnerability is, I guess, that they can't, uh, that they can't get um, get back to their uh, their good uh, growth path and their fiscal responsibility. So uh, uh, it's um, it's something that uh, that may have the, the, the political situation you you believe may uh, may uh, affect the uh, the economics and also what's happening in the European Union. That's the that's the, the most uh, important indicator, right? Well, uh, well, politics are important because they affect people's uh, um, perception of risk. The more political turmoil there is, the more risky uh, investors uh, think uh, it is. So uh, a... Um, a good, uh, solid political situation in uh, Romania would do go a long way to uh, helping in the uh, in the economic recovery. But I'm not a political scientist, and I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the other thing that I worry about is um, um, this is not just Romania, but it, it's all countries. How are we going to find the right rate at which to reopen the economies? I mean, the governments are all over the place. Um, I'm concerned that we're doing too many miscalculations and that we won't open. I'm concerned, quite frankly, that we won't open fast enough. Uh, because I think originally the reason for lockdowns was because everybody was afraid that the health system would be overwhelmed. That's right. There's too many cases uh, and not enough health resources to That's right. yeah. to, um, to cure the people who do get sick and to care for them. So, um, and that's why we flattened the curve or why we tried to flatten the curve or why the world tried to flatten the curve. Uh, but the curve has largely been flattened. Uh, in most countries and in most places, um, the fear of the hospitals running out of beds and running out of ventilators has more or less disappeared. Uh, so therefore, I'm beginning to worry about the effect of the uh, lockdowns or failure to reopen in terms of uh, increasing the deaths and illness from other diseases. For example, in Monday's New York Times, there was a, a long article that told about the rate of vaccination has declined. People are staying at home and not going to get vaccinations. And that's going to mean people are, more and more people are going to get the measles or going to get other diseases that are not COVID and have been able to be controlled which may not be able to be controlled uh, in the future because of the economic uh, downturn. There was another article in the New York Times today about um, uh, poorer people who can't afford to pay for health care or whose insurance is going to be lost because they've lost their jobs. So that, that and that's going to have a, a health effect. That's going to cause lives. So we have to balance the, uh, the economic uh, misery caused by keeping a t an economy tightly closed and the increase in coronavirus infections if we open it uh, too, too quickly. 
I would rather err on being open um, to uh, sooner. To, yeah. So I, 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 that's that's a big concern that I have. Yeah, it's, uh, I should say, uh, one of the most difficult trade-offs, uh, one of the most difficult decisions a politician must take during this, uh, these days to keep the trade-off between fast economic recovery, opening fast, uh, putting uh, everything uh, in-place and, uh, and restarting the engine of the economy and all all the rest, and also be careful that uh, a very abrupt opening may uh, lead to the, in, uh, the increase of the um, of the contagion of the of the cases and we see that we see that in the united states in some of the the states um, uh, the um, the cases are um, going up and also we see to a certain extent in uh, in romania of course uh, we don't see that the hospitals are um, are overwhelmed uh, yet but it may it may happen. So uh, it's indeed, as you say, a very very difficult uh, a very difficult situation. But um, as an economist, do you think that um, that can we can we postpone this uh, massive uh, reopening in in economic terms? Is you know are the governments uh, the, the banks able to sustain financially this? Uh, this um, uh, time when the economy is uh, is brought well, the longer it takes to reopen, the longer it's going to take to recover. Because what's going to happen is that uh, if you continue to be more or less locked down, or at least highly restricted in economic activity that can go on, the balance sheets of companies and households become overloaded with debt because they can't, yeah. they, they they don't can't the debt. only way you can survive is to go more into debt. So that's going to weigh heavily on the economy for a very long time to come. If, if the debt increases too rapidly. Now, the good news is that our banks are in much better shape than they were, say, in 2007, 2008. Uh, that's the good news, but it can get bad pretty quickly. So, um, and if households are, are running up debt and can't afford to buy automobiles or appliances or whatever, uh, and it's going to take a long time for the balance sheets of the uh, economic actors uh, to uh, uh, reach a better equilibrium. Um, so I worry that by not opening. And, and you're, there are ways to mitigate the potential effects from opening. I mean, you can still stay home. Uh, I mean, individuals have that choice. Uh, they, don't, they don't have to go to movies or, or to uh, oh, <laughs> uh, if, if, if individuals want to save or protect Sad. them, they have all the means to do it. And it's the rich individuals who have better means to do it, poor people That's don't right. have the means uh, to help themselves. So you need, they need jobs and they need income. So I think, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough, I'd hate to be the governor of New York or the mayor of New York or the mayor of any, even in Podunk, uh, even uh, my hometown Bellevue, uh, uh, because it's such a difficult uh, set of decisions to make. Yes, uh, yes, yeah, in, indeed. It's a very, very, uh, very tough, uh, very tough time. And, uh, and also, um, of course, the people are suffering, people in culture and arts, as, I, as we, we said, uh, are suffering, but also small businesses that are very, very, um, very hard hit by the uh, mm -hmm. by this uh, situation and they provide a lot of uh, jobs and a lot of um, the energy of of uh, of the economy but there is an organization that hasn't stopped and can't be stopped by the pandemic or the crisis and the name of that organization is alianza 
And in Alianza, there are, um, I think, all the, the former uh, U.S. ambassadors to uh, Romania are members. Also, uh, people in uh, you know, the economic sector and in, in other, other sectors uh, that have dealt to, uh, to Romania and know Romania well. Um, it's indeed an amazing organization. We're very happy to, uh, to partner with Alianza in uh, several projects. But tell us a little bit more about this organization because probably some people don't know much about it. Yeah, well, uh, the organization was initially founded by, mainly by Mar Mark uh, Gittenstein, uh, who was the uh, US ambassador to Romania. I'm trying to remember when, well, in early 10 years or so ago. That's right. Uh, and, um, He and the other co-founder was uh, Jim Rosapep, also a former uh, ambassador to Romania. But not all former ambassadors are involved in Alianza. Uh, the, the, I, I thought everybody's involved in Alianza. Even the Romanian Cultural Institute in New York is involved in Alianza. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, it's it, it is it's it's a it's a very good organization. It's uh, it's been running for about five six years. Um, it holds an annual gala, uh, usually in the fall, and unfortunately this fall it will be either canceled or, or, or postponed. Um, but it is a, an organization that's devoted to uh, furthering uh, uh, interchange and communication between Romanians and Americans in different fields, improving the relationship, improving the cross-cultural uh, fertilization uh, in um, cultural affairs, which is why we're very pleased to be working with, uh, uh, with you fellows, uh, the Romanian Cultural Institute. Um, it also, I think, has a a useful value in uh, bringing people together in the economics field, particularly in um, uh, technology industries where Romania is a leader, both in Romania and in Romanians. Romanian uh, born people are very important in Silicon Valley. That's right. And so there's a lot of cross fertilization there on the, on, the, on, the, on the technology side and on national security. I think, uh, you know, we both have a, um, a common interest in, in preserving uh, uh, Romania's uh, democratic institutions, uh, in preserving uh, uh, stability in, in a region that can sometimes be a little bit uh, uh, frightening in terms of uh, uh, government behavior. So, uh, yeah. Strengthening the uh, strategic partnership as well, yeah. which is- Yeah, uh, and of course, uh, Romania is a very important strategic partner to the United States. So, so it's an organization that um, focuses on co uh, uh, communication, exchange, and cross-fertilization in these, in these fields. How can, uh, how can people join in the efforts of, uh, of Alianza? Uh, a lot of uh, leaders of the Romanian American community are members of Alianza. At the gala in, uh, in Washington, you can see a lot of uh, uh, the who's who in the Romanian American uh, communi community, also in, uh, you know, in the, this um, growing group of Americans uh, who know Romania so well. How can other people be involved in the programs, in the efforts, in the uh, uh, advocacy um, effort of uh, Alianza? Well, um, first of all, you can visit the website and see, see what's, uh, what's happening. Uh, and uh, you can write and ask to join or to be put on their list. 
get an invitation to the gala when and if it happens, uh, uh, and um, and just uh, and also Ichere, I think is now an important uh, door for us to go through to uh, learn more about Alianza. I mean, your your relationship with them is uh, is relatively new, but uh, I think very promising, and I hope it works out for both Ichere and Alianza. It's uh, it's already born fruits, and I think uh, it's it's going to develop. Uh, it's um, unfortunate that we are not able to work together at the gala this um, this year, but there will be other um, other instances yeah. where we can uh, <laughs> we can uh, develop our uh, partnerships. We will, of course, continue continue to work with uh, Alianza and other organizations. Romanian American or American organizations that want to strengthen the Romanian American uh, uh, relations and partnership uh, for us is uh, it's very important. It was one of the perennial uh, objectives. Um, uh, before we um, uh, we end our conversation, it's already you know one hour since we uh, since we started. I'd like to uh, remind our viewers to uh, visit our um, website, rciusa.info, or um, get in touch on social media. We are doing a lot of things uh, these days. Our online program is made of uh, several uh, permanent series in Romanian history, literature, um, conversations like this, uh, music, visual arts, um, uh, cultural uh, history, and we are uh, producing a lot of original um, and exclusive content, and you can learn more about Romania, about our culture, by, um, by following this, um, uh, this uh, series. So far, we have uh, received a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, praise, I should say, a very good response from our public that is growing uh, day by day. So we are very, uh, very proud of that. I'm very thankful to all those who are um, watching our um, uh, watching our programs and write uh, to us in such a, such a nice uh, terms. Um, Dr. Charles uh, Frank, thank you for um, for being for sharing with this afternoon uh, with us. Um, it's been a very interesting uh, it, it's interesting conversation. I truly hope you are wrong, eighty percent of uh, of what you predicted, and the recovery will be steep, and we will come back to. Uh, to a um, to a uh, to the life we enjoyed before, but um, joke aside, uh, I'm sure that uh, that it's going to be a tough road ahead, and we have to be uh, well uh, prepared. Well, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate uh, your efforts to uh, improve the relationship between our two organizations, Alianza and Ichere, and uh, I look forward to working with you in the future. And also, you're, you're, you're right very close to us. We can always go down to, your, to the Cultural Institute, to the uh, consulate, and, and, and see you there. And we'll do that more and more as we, uh, as we get over this uh, coronavirus uh, crisis. Charles, we are longing for our public. We are longing to go back to the to the physical uh, stages, but uh, we have to wait uh, until the phase four of the reopening to see what's uh, phase four. Uh, phase four, yeah. That's apparently for these uh, cultural venues, it's uh, phase four, and it's a lot of uh, restrictions. So while we are starting to plan for that moment, we are uh, eagerly anticipating that moment. But um, but let's uh, let's wait and uh, and uh, and see. But definitely, we long for our public. We long for our time when you and others. Um, uh, um, came to our events uh, here in New York or throughout the United States, because it's not only an institute for New York, it's an institute for the entire United States and also uh, Canada. 
before we go, I'd like to uh, thank all our, of all our viewers. I thank you for your kind words. I thank you for, um, for watching our uh, programs. Um, I'd like to remind, uh, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, all our program is dedicated to um, medical personnel, to the essential um, workers, especially Romanian American and Canadian Romanian, Romanian Canadian, um, who are doing a fantastic job and have done a fantastic job to keep us safe. So um, see you at uh, the other um, programs at the Romanian Cultural Institute in New York. Thank you for watching. Uh, stay safe and keep close. Thank, Thank you. you.